Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Hi, and welcome to the live market update with our team here for Morton Brown Family Wealth. I'm Katie Brown, and I'm just going to apologize because I am working remotely today in stormy Rhode Island, and so my internet is not allowing my video to pop up. So my apologies, um, but we have Dennis and Cody live on video. So once again, just really wanted to thank you all for joining us today as we take time to check in with you, our community. You know, we want to find you where you are today and address some of the concerns and opportunities that exist here at the midpoint of 2020. So let's start by talking about where we are, and not in terms of where the markets closed yesterday or how the community around you might be, but more of where are you on your journey to becoming the best version of yourself? Because that's what our money is for, isn't it? And at various points over the last six months, you may have been worried about your health, job, your business, um, investments, family, you know, children, grandchildren, the social fabric, or just the future in general. It's been a time to focus on the here and now, but we throw caution in that because if all of our decisions start to emphasize the short term, we can set ourselves up for challenges later. You know, with investing, we often talk about investing for the long term, and it's almost, it's almost cliche to say, um, but that's because we know that we need to weather any number of conditions to reach the financial goal. And the same goes for our outlook on life. You know, our goal today is to help pop our heads up from that short terminism of the last few months and check in on your journey to a purposeful life supported by confident financial decisions. So that's what we'd like to do, actually, is check in. Um, there's a little chat box that you'll see on your screen down in the right-hand corner. And we would love for you guys to each give us kind of one word about how you're feeling right now. So whether that's, you know, optimistic or anxious or secure, what, whatever, whatever it may be, however you're feeling, we would love to kind of hear from you. And this is anonymous, so just feel free to post in there and let us know what you think. Yes. Yes, thank you. And Dennis, I'm going to let you chime in um, with some of the words or, or feelings if you if you see those kind of pop in. Sure, sure. Um, so I'll, I'll volunteer my own to start. Cautious, for sure. For sure, cautious is a word. You're stuck. That's a good one. Yeah. Yeah. Securely, securely anxious. That, that's an overachieving two words there, but I but I get that. That's. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. that's, that's almost Orwellian. That's, that's, that's securely anxious. I like that. All right. <laughs> Anyone else? Slight, slightly stressed. Get that. I get that. Okay. It close. Anyone else? Have a strong conviction. Great. Those are. So we're hearing. There's uh, some of the words have movement like anxiety has movement. Some of the words don't, like feeling stuck or, or, or stressed. Um, I think I think we can all, all relate to those. And that's what we wanna talk through a little bit today. So um, yeah, I think that's definitely consistent with what we're hearing from the people that we talk to and even other professionals in, in other spheres. So yeah, so Katie, how about we talk about kind of the plan for today? Sure. Yes, yeah, so we wanted to go over a couple of different things for today. Actually, three things to, to check in on your journey. Uh, we have kind of three things that we want to go through. So one is just to review with the financial landscape as it stands today. And then we want to discuss how, how to invest when you may be feeling like I need to go all in on stocks or maybe all out to cash. What does that gray area look like? And then finally, we want to discuss some different things that you could be doing now to make progress on your plan. So once again, now that you guys all found the, the little chat function there, um, please, please, please feel free to ask questions because we want this to be interactive. And you know, we've we've discovered that if one person has a thought in their mind, oftentimes a dozen other people have a, a similar question. So 
don't be shy. Um, and, and if you want to pause us at any point too to clarify anything that we are talking about or to spend a little bit more time on a topic, you know, we're happy to do that. And we'll make sure to leave a little bit of time at the end for some, some questions and answers as well. So to kick off on the financial landscape, I'm going to turn it back over to uh, Dennis and Cody, if you could give us an update. Right. All right. Thanks, Katie. So here we are. It's the last day of the quarter. As of five minutes ago, the market closed on, on, the, on the second quarter. And it may not feel like it, but coming off of the heels of one of the worst quarters we've seen in a long time, the second quarter of 2020 is one of the strongest stock market quarters in about 40 years. I think we'll have to see where the numbers come in, Cody. But are we talking, you know, 30, 40 percent returns, best since 1975, something like yeah. that? Yeah. Yeah. So some of that has to do with timing. So it, there's there's this uh, there's a strange thing about kind of marking a timestamp on December 31st or March 31st or any end of a time period to say, well, we're just going to stop the price there and measure it to another point. The lows of the market were actually March 23rd. So right before the end of first quarter, beginning of second quarter is when we timestamped the beginning of this quarter and everything took off. So we have a few charts to share with you. Cody, why don't you pull up the first one here that just yep. kind of shows our, our um, distance from the March lows. Oh, here. Hang on. Okay. Yeah, let's go back up to the top. There we are. Okay. So Cody, what, what are we looking at here? So this is from the March lows on March 23rd. It's when we hit the lows of 2020, which will hopefully be the lows that we see. So this is a rally that we've seen in all the major US indexes. So the NASDAQ, the Dow, the S&P, and then we also threw in the Barclays Ag, so the fixed income. And then we also threw in an international um, index too. So you can see how the Ag, the Barclays, um, the fixed income was steady, was up around 6%. And all the equity markets that got hit very hard in, in February and March had a nice rebound um, since then. So one of the things that we can point out here is that there was a um, panicking at the lows is never a good idea, but this really shows the stark contrast. So for somebody who might have gone into at least partially into bonds or into stocks down here, you missed out on 80% of the rally that happened over the course of the second quarter. So again, our timestamp at the beginning of the second quarter was right here. Um, another thing you'll see is, and we're gonna talk a little bit more about this, is the difference between the NASDAQ and everything else and what it means to be concentrated in high growth companies or in the most favored companies and to be diversified into other things. So um, overall, about a 30% return over the course of the quarter. Um, and the NASDAQ ends up significantly on top for that time period. Let's go to the second chart. Year to date. This is year to date. All right, so now we're factoring in, you know, you get to see all of the dips and it was dips in everything. We talked about this when we did our market update first quarter. Cody, should, there's that dip in bonds that happened even there, right? There's yeah, our- so, so right here is where everything in, in two weeks from, this is around March 9th, the two weeks following, you can see everything pretty much sold off. Mm -hmm. There are no safe havens during that time period. Yeah. So right here, the, the Barclays, which is the fixed income at, at index, was up around 5% year to date. It dropped around 9% in that two weeks. Stocks dropped over 20% in two weeks down to the lows on March 23rd. Mm -hmm. So this is where our time periods can be confusing sometimes. You can look at a, a first quarter that told a very dire story, a second quarter that was the bounce back, but that leaves us a little bit confused about what to do from here. Um, now the, these deep declines, and that was almost a 40% decline from top to bottom in most of the major stock indexes, and then the bounce back, it feels really unusual, and this time is so unique, but it's actually not all that unusual. We found that JP Morgan had a great chart that we pulled up, and this is the next one here. Um, Cody, explain what this describes for us. Yep, so this is the last 40 years of the S&P 500. It shows the numbers on the bottom, just that little dot, shows what the inner year lows were. So every single year, there was an inter low. The average inter low of, of the years over the past 40 was 13.8%. So almost 14% on every single year, 
at one point we, we were down around 14 percent and then with that said you can see at the at the top the annual returns that we actually had a went positive over 75 percent of the time well 75 percent of the time three out of every four times we ended the year positive even when the inner year's lows were were over 13 percent so famously you have a year like 1987 where this was the crash of 1987 where we were down 34 percent but still finished the year positive too you had several other years with 30 percent declines where the market rallied pretty substantially but the other thing is when you do have these big dips you also tend to have longer periods of higher performance or sustained performance so big dip longer periods about performance so this is where we are today down and this was as of june 25th so we're probably up a little bit from that minus five that we saw there yeah. but as unusual as this feels it has happened before even in our lifetimes the circumstances just tend to be a little bit uh, a little bit different the catalysts are always different let's uh let's go to the next next slide here oh hi katie and katie's back <laughs> all right so the volatility index um this is, if things still feel volatile, they certainly are compared to where they are normally. And this is this index goes back uh, over the last decade. That average of about 16, we're more than double that right now. But look at where we are relative to the peak back in March. Yeah. So if there's a, if there's a bull market anywhere, it's in parabolic charts. <laughs> we've seen that so often. I mean, if you think back to, um, we've seen numbers of COVID statistics, we've seen unemployment numbers, we've seen Fed balance sheet, just everything going straight up and to the right. And this is another example. Fortunately, this number's come back down, but we're still well above normal levels of volatility. Yep. All right, so talk, talk about this. This was a really interesting one, Cody. Explain what we're looking at here. Yep. So like we discussed in that that one chart year to date in mid March is when we had the very steep sell off and it's when the Fed and Congress started realizing that they need to step in. So this is when Fed, the Fed said they were going to lower the interest rate down to zero. And you can see that's the orange line. So it started around one point five percent and it was actually higher to start the year. But with everything going on, this graph shows it's starting around one point five percent. And then you can see in March, it just drops all the way down to zero when they announced that. And then you can see once it hit zero right here, you can see that the equity market just took off because they knew they were gonna have backing from the Federal Reserve. And then also um, we, had the, we had the stimulus um, from the Congress around then too. The, the reason why, why this works like that, the, the market is so tied up in confidence that market participants need to feel like there's some measure of safety that if I put money to work here, it's going to, over time, it's going to um, grow. And the risk during that big drop that Cody pointed out was that there was no one to backstop these. No one wanted to buy these assets. Everyone wanted to go to cash. And the Fed stepped in and said, not only are we going to um, put some stimulus policies in place, we're gonna buy some things that we've never bought before. We're going to buy things like corporate bonds. We're going to buy high yield bonds. We're going to buy ETFs. We're, we're going to, if there is an asset that we that might plunge in price, we're going to step in and buy it. And for if we're using the market as a as a person, the market says, "Well, great, we're comfortable buying more stocks, bonds, everything else because we know the Fed is right alongside with us, and they're not going to let anything bad happen." So yeah. that's the trend that you tend to develop. It also creates what we call a moral hazard that are we only investing in this because the Fed's there, therefore does the Fed always have to be there alongside of us? It's a, it's a challenge, but the, the, the policymakers had to decide how much, more, more, how much longer were they willing to see this decline happen and what are the implications of the opposite? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And this also, if you hear us, you might have heard us use the, uh, the acronym TINA before, as in T-I-N-A, there is no alternative what this tells us is when interest rates go down to zero and people can't earn money on CDs or savings accounts or bonds or other things that are related to interest rates, they need to put their money somewhere else to earn returns. So yeah. if you're trying to earn four or 5% and you can't get it in a bond, 
you have to buy something else. So it almost compels people to buy riskier assets. So that's when we say the Tina trade, there is no alternative other than to buy risky assets like stocks. Yeah. All right. So this, this is a great chart. This is like another one from JP Morgan where they put together a list of how related, how correlated different bonds and fixed income instruments are to the stock market. So on the bottom, on your x-axis here, you have how correlated something is to the S&P 500. The further to the right, the more it's going to act like a stock. And then here you have the yield that they offer. So the higher paying the instrument, the higher up it is on the y-axis. So way out here, you have junk bonds. High yield, very high correlation to stocks. So some of these bonds, lower quality bonds, if you buy them, their prices can go up and down just like a stock can, and you can lose your money just like you can in a stock. On the flip side, you have these low yielding, low correlation treasuries, two year, 10 year, 30 year, um, five year treasuries, low yielding, but they're not going to act like stocks. In fact, they're negative correlation. They're gonna move in the opposite direction from what stocks do. Then here is cash. Cash is actually more correlated to the stock market than some of these treasury bonds are because it doesn't move anywhere relative to stocks. Stocks will move up and down. Cash will stay about stable. Bonds will fluctuate along with it. The point here is that you have to be careful reaching for income. Being invested in this space down here in treasuries isn't going to earn you very much. As Cody said, we're down in the you know, less than 1% range, but they're not going to act as stabilizers. They're going to be very secure when the market is volatile. If you reach for income, the higher you reach for income, the more your bonds are going to act like stocks. And that's the opposite of diversification. We want to make sure that our bonds are acting like safety and income and our stocks are providing appreciation. We, we are tending to stay away from this side, the higher yielding, higher risk side of bonds right now. And it's one of the ways that we focus on safety when we build up a portfolio. I think it's uh, important to point out too that this is, sorry, go ahead, Katie. No, I, I was just gonna say, I, I love this chart. I know we spent a lot of time last time talking about not all bonds are the same. Um, and this really kind of, it illustrates that, that very well and that reach for yield doesn't come you know, without a cost. So just really appreciate this chart. Yeah. Go ahead, Cody. Yeah. yeah, I was just going to say, I think this is this because this was pulled up by JP Morgan. We had a call with them on Friday. And I think this is just one of the important um, reasons that we, we we have an outside manager that are managing the fixed income portion for us. Because you, you see this, that inside of the fixed income, there's a lot of different moving variables. I'm going to come back to one of our charts back here because I want to address you know, some of the words that we heard were, um, uh, what, what was the phrase? We heard slightly stressed, securely anxious. And I just want to point out a little bit about the, the idea of safety. And especially when we're talking about being investors, safety is going to come from the bond side of the equation. If you're when you're invested with us, there's always going to be a safety component. This, this line here, this was what safe money was doing in the throes of the crisis. Since then, it's bounced back to what it normally does. We have, have a lot of conviction that safe money is going to be safe and that there are ways to be safe in this environment um, from, from market risk, from big drops. And there's a lot of confidence there and I don't think there's reason to be uh, insecure. One of the things we wanna talk about today though is concentration. And it's tempting to look at something like the NASDAQ, which is up probably more than this now, about over 12% so far this year, even with the big dip. The temptation is to say, well, maybe I could own something like that. And by being positive, it's going to provide safety. But if we were to crack open this NASDAQ 100, inside of this fund, which owns about 100 stocks, 47% of that fund is in five stocks. It's in Amazon, it's in Apple, it's in Microsoft, it's in Google, it's, it's in uh, Apple. So those five stocks, if they 
catch a cold, like Facebook's feeling a lot of pressure over from advertisers uh, over you know some of their policies. If those stocks catch a cold or get sneeze, that fund catches the cold, ideally. So we just want to make sure that diversification doesn't just mean owning different funds. It means knowing what's inside of those funds so we understand it's up, but it's up because of a handful of things. We'd rather be positive based on a number of conditions because conditions can change uh, quickly. It's, really, it's the foundation under our feet. Yep. The next thing we want to talk about today is this idea of investing in broken things. And we've had a lot of conversations with investors over the years about when the market is high, why would I buy bonds? Or if domestic stocks are doing well, why would I own international? Or maybe even why would I own commodities or real estate? They're out of favor. There's some great work done recently on why we diversify and why now might be a good time to think closely about how we diversify your investments. And also it's an antidote to that really tough decision of, as Katie mentioned in the beginning, being all in or all out. And sometimes you want to be all in stocks, sometimes it's going to be all in cash. Let's look forward to this slide here. This diversification and the average investor. So on the top, it shows the last, um, since the financial crisis, since October of 2007, it shows three things. The green is the S&P 500. The dark blue is a 40-60 stock and bond portfolio. And the blue is a 60-40 stock and bond portfolio. It shows how deep the market goes when you're fully exposed to stocks. And you're a little bit better off when you have 60-40 or 40-60, the stocks and bonds but it shows how much more quickly you regain your high water mark. So the high water mark in 2007 was here. It took until November of 2009 for the more conservative portfolio to get back. It took until October of 10 for the 60-40. It took until March of 2012 for the S&P 500 to get back to its previous high water mark. Now, over that time, over the ensuing eight years, the S&P 500 did very well and outperformed all of them. But we have to be wary of if the idea is getting back to our benchmark, you're getting back to our high water mark, being diversified can improve your odds of doing that much sooner. So yeah. what does it mean to be diversified? Cody, talk about the bottom tier, this 20 year annualized returns. Yeah, so this bottom tier, I thought it's really interesting. So this goes over the average 20 year return. I mean, the average annual return over the past 20 years. So from 1999, right before the dot com bubble till the end of last year, till 2019. So you can see that the S&P 500, the average return was around 6.1%. And then so the 4060 model, which is around a balanced model is around 5.4%. And then you can see this average investor. So this is when someone is investing on by themselves and they're trying to time the market. This is what the average investor, their average return over the past 20 years. So, I mean, this is, it's just very, I mean, we had a lot of hard conversations with some people that were scared of the market and they wanted to go into cash. And I mean, this is just one of the reasons why it, it's very important to stay invested yeah i think i think one of the interesting things about that two and a half percent is it wasn't that the average investor chooses the wrong investment it's that they consistently choose the wrong investment because they're underperforming everything uh in, including their own home the home prices went up about 3.4 percent which is only slightly higher than the average investor returns so the reason that happens is because there's there's this sense that you have to um, find performance by chasing the last thing that was doing well and prevents us from um, it prevents us from buying and holding. In other words, if you'd bought and held real estate in REITs or in gold, you know, you would have you would have had terrible returns in gold for the last eight years. You would only made, you know, a fraction of what you made in stocks. But for the 10 years prior to that, you would have almost quadrupled your money. And so this is where the time in the market really factors in. And so but if you're going to be diversified now, if you're going to buy and hold, that means certain things are going to be, are going to feel broken. Let's talk a little about this broke, this idea of broken assets. So if you're looking across your portfolio, you might say, 
I own international an international stock fund. This fund hasn't been doing as well as the S&P 500 for many years, or I own a bond fund that's underperforming, or maybe gold or some other asset. Research Affiliates, uh, a great research shop, um, recently came out with a report, a survey of broken asset classes. And you remember, may remember famously a, a headline, this was from the late 70s, it's called The Death of Equities. Right here on the right-hand side, we put a picture of it. It was in Business Week, and the 70s was a period of, you know, the stock market returns were, were negative. Uh, you had high inflation, we had high interest rates, or rising interest rates. And it was just a, a, not a great time to be investing in traditional stocks and bonds. In fact, I'll hear stories from people who were in our industry back in the day who said that they were, became commodity brokers because no one wanted to buy a stock. So here you have a headline that says it's the death of equities. And research affiliates went back and said, well, what other assets have been declared broken at different times? And what did they do after they were determined to be broken? So here's a list of them. You see US stocks in August of 1979 the quote from the article saying, for better or worse, the US economy probably has to regard the death of equities as a near permanent condition. Now, imagine investing, putting your money in stocks in 1979 and riding it out until now, probably would have been a pretty good move. But the same thing was true in other assets. Real estate, in 1998, Barron's wrote, real estate funds continue to take a beating as investors worry about deflation Real estate is losing its power to diversify a portfolio. Now, we just saw in this previous chart that over the last 20 years, since 1999, so two months after that was written, the single best asset class of performance over the last 20 years has been real estate. Same thing with commodities, oil. I, this, Full disclosure, I was a newly minted lieutenant at Fort Bliss, Texas in, in June of 1999. Right around the time The Economist was saying cheap oil is likely to remain so. And I remember going to the gas station and turning over a $5 bill to get five gallons of gas. And oil, as we all know, shot up over $100 a barrel in, in, into the late 2000s. But it's been in other places too, small value stocks, high yield bonds. All of these different assets have been declared broken because they underperformed something else for a very long time, usually the US stock market. We're comparing it to stocks, stocks are better, we shouldn't be investing in this, and then a crash comes and everything inverts. So what are some things that are maybe broken now? Emerging market stocks. People are wary of China, they're wary about some of these smaller countries, less developed economies. Value stocks. Warren Buffett is out of favor again. He's had it happen multiple times in his career, but the, those stocks that are um, trading at fair prices and lower growth, those have, those have been out of favor relative to the higher growth Apples and Amazons of the world for almost a decade. That's why the NASDAQ is so high. So people are saying, maybe we just shouldn't own those companies anymore. Maybe we should just be piling into that handful of companies that are high growth, high opportunity. So if we go to the next slide, research affiliates mapped out those different asset classes and you can see Everything from the green is the S&P 500 from 1979 through the following, uh, I believe this is the following three years. No, five, five years. years. Five, five years. years. Yeah. So um, real estate is in the dark blue, commodities are in red, and it mapped out all of these different times that over a five, when they've underperformed for three years, what did they do over the five following years? 88% of the time returns were positive and the average return was 80% over five years for assets that were declared broken. So what this speaks to is the patience game of investing and the idea that sometimes if you're trying to weigh, how am I doing? And you look and say, am I, well, this is outperforming versus that, I should go where the performance is higher. Not necessarily. There's an example given in the, in the research affiliate story about a, a board and a board responsible for an investment portfolio, maybe an endowment or something of that kind, and how tense their discussions were around rebalancing, saying, we have made some money over here, we're down over here, we're supposed to rebalance and buy more of the stuff that's down, but I think that's a broken asset, that's not gonna come back. And they had to fight tooth and nail just to do a simple rebalancing 
But that made all the difference because lo and behold, months later, the cycle turned and that broken asset became the redeemer. And that happens over and over again when we're investing. I think the, the best analogy for this, think of this as the, um, as the Forrest Gump analogy. When we look back over even the last 20 years, I mean, all of us can think back to, um, you know, 20 years ago, 1999 or so. And if we're standing there in 1999, we are on the cusp of this, you know, witnessing history period where we were going to have three bear markets over the next 20 years and sandwiched in there would be the longest bull market in history. That's what we faced over the last 20 years. Different investments worked at different times for different reasons in all of those periods. And just like, you know, Forrest Gump, you're, you're kind of making your way, meandering through history, having to change and adapt without ever having to abandon that true character or true nature of who you are. That's the challenge in investing. You don't have to do the Herculean things. You just have to make those changes and adaptations. And that's why you own a little bit of each of these. And we always do. When, when you're invested in our portfolios, we have a thoughtful process that doesn't have to be reactive and pick which one of these is going to outperform. It's how are we comfortable owning this in the long term? What's the best way to own it? And then making sure that we stick with that discipline and not bail at the wrong times because we're feeling too fearful. So yeah. if we uh, definitely feel the way. What do you, um, any other observations kind of on the broken asset side, Katie or Cody? Yeah, I mean, it's just, it's, it's fascinating, right? Because I think that it is easy to reach that point of, oh my gosh, I can't look at another, you know, another down year in emerging markets. Why is it still there? And, mm -hmm. and not to say it's going to be up 80% over the next five years, because we don't know, but it's, at, at some point it'll be, it'll be their season and it, for every other asset class as well. And we can't predict it any more than the next person. So as you said, making sure that, that we hold things for the, the right reasons and in the right way and with the right perspective makes all the mm -hmm. difference. Yeah. And so two things. One is I definitely want to point out that when it comes to who belongs in this class, we belong in the average investor class too. But we have to have a process in place. We have the same fears, we have the same biases, and we have the same you know, gut instincts sometimes. But that's where when we approach a time like early to mid-March of this year, where the market's selling off dramatically, there's a lot of fear and panic in the market, we have a process where we pause, we step back and say, what are our best instincts? Our best instincts, or our better instincts are to do things incrementally so not make dramatic moves dive all in or dive all out make an incremental move that is fearful when others are greedy and greedy when others are fearful so we bought value stocks in march we added to that we bought higher quality bonds when they rallied a little bit uh, so we we tried to introduce some of those good disciplines because that that's what's really the the um that's the value of working with an advisor is to make sure that we are not tempted to move out of there. And it takes a good process for us to execute on that. And so when you see us talking about, um, you know, being disciplined and that a process is going to win out, it's because we know that these instincts exist, you know, for us and for anyone who's investing. Yeah. Pause there. Are there any, any questions as far as uh, from, from our audience here about, what's happening in the markets or particular asset classes that they might be wondering about. You know, typically when we invest, we think in terms of stocks, large and small, domestic and international. We think of commodities like, um, you know, whether it's oil and gas or whether it's a um, agriculture or uh, minerals. And then you also think in terms of different flavors of bonds. Are there any questions regarding particular assets, how they're performing or, um, or, or what their potential is in the future. All right, well, if you do hear anything, feel free to, to weigh in, but um, I'm gonna turn it over to, ah, one of the things I, I wanna mention here, we talked a little bit about where the, where the sentiment is right now, just with some fear. There's also been a good bit of speculation I don't know if um, you follow the trend of day trading, but apparently we are back to those days of 1999 where everyone is a day trader. Cody, what can you tell us a little bit about the, the Robinhood trend 
and also what, what's happened with investor sentiment on the other side of the pendulum. Yeah, okay. So Robinhood, which is the new um, app that a lot of people are trading on, it's, it's no commissions. Um, it's a lot of new, it's a lot of newer invest, investors. So normally the stock prices that you see that they're investing in are, are on the cheaper side. Um, but the day trading that we see, so Innova is actually um, a company that's in Plymouth meeting that they're, I think just today, they actually came out with some news regarding the COVID vaccine. But to start the year, there was only 5,000 individuals holding the stock on Robinhood. And today there's over 250,000 people holding it. The stock price has gone up 800% so far wow. year to date. Um, and then on the other side of things is American Airlines. Everyone knows the deal with, with travel. So to start the year, 10,000 people held American Airlines. Now over 700,000 people hold it, but the stock price has fell 50%. And, and you can look at the same things on this downtrend for cruise lines or, or other um, airline companies, it's the day trading speculation is just it's just crazy yeah we had we had the Hertz phenomenon a couple of weeks ago where Hertz was going to sell stocks to investors with the caveat that this stock is going to zero so it just tells you there, there's very much a barbell approach and I think it, like so many other elements of, of society right now where there's there's uh, tension at the extremes and people are feeling either really conservative or, or, or insecure or they're feeling super confident and speculative and, and very little in between. So um, we, do, we do have a question here about the prognosis for energy and oil stocks. So, you know, oil and, and energy is a demand situation. So we've had an absolute collapse in demand. And that's, that's what drove oil prices to the negative back in April. One, one of the more, another one of those charts that was kind of the re reverse parabola, whatever that, that's called. Um, <laughs> but the idea that that oil prices could go negative and then rebound as quickly as they have. I mean, energy stocks are some of the best performers this quarter, even bouncing off of that rebound. I think longer term, what it's going to end up looking like in oil and a lot of other industries is consolidation. With Chesapeake Energy going under, I think you're, you're going to see a lot of the, um, the leverage bets, people who borrowed a ton of money, invested in a ton of shale, that's going to start to collapse under its own weight. I mean, I think what they're realizing is that, especially for some of the shale plays, that the productivity of those wells was not as sustainable as they thought. They, they couldn't last as long, which required more and more investment and more and more capital to be put in there. So I think larger players are gonna gobble up those assets and either abandon them, which might be okay because of the prop up prices a little bit, or find, you know, more efficient ways to uh, to extract. But I think there's gonna be continued consolidation because so many, energy was a sector where there were so many companies issuing a ton of debt with low interest rates, funding operations with that debt, funding dividends with the debt, that a stiff breeze was gonna blow that industry over and it's happened. I think the major players like Exxon and Chevron will be okay in the long term, but we wouldn't advise going into master limited partnerships or some of the other um, places where you might speculate on, on oil because picking winners and losers is gonna be really difficult. Good question though. One of the things that I'll, I'll mention just um, on specific companies, we talked about the five stocks that are driving the NASDAQ. There are also stocks that will drive the Dow. And I know the Dow is the, head, the, the member that'll get the headlines a lot of the time. And if you look across you know, there's why the NASDAQ is outperforming, but also why the Dow is underperforming. And one of the reasons is that the Dow is 30 stocks as opposed to the hundreds that are in the S&P 500. And it includes some like, you know, Goldman Sachs or IBM or Caterpillar, which are all down about 15% or at least over 10% so far this year. And when you have some of those anchors there dragging things down, again, what's inside of that fund really matters. So the Dow is going to have some more of those value stocks um, that, that are not quite performing as well, and it's going to act as an anchor to that. So you'll see disparity, on, especially in recent days where the NASDAQ will be up 1%, the Dow and the S&P might even be negative. 
uh, over those times, just because of the way the, the indexes are made up. A couple other just frequently asked questions. So we've been asked often, when is the other shoe going to drop? Um, I think we're starting to see a little bit, you know, when people ask that they mean different things. When is the, you know, when is the COVID-19 shoe going to drop? When are we going to get a resurgence? We may already be seeing that now. I mean, the data is not great coming out of um, certain states about new cases. There's also the stock market. When is the stock market other shoe going to drop? When is it going to fall? Our feeling is that that other shoe um, is not necessarily going to drop in the same way it has before. You know, we've, we've evolved a lot since February in the types of risks that are out there. We've also created new ones. I think in the, in the second quarter, one of our lessons learned was that the, the closing down of an economy can create some ripple effects that maybe we didn't foresee. And it's going to be come in the form of negative oil prices. It's going to come in the form of, you know, interesting disparities in local economies. There's just those ripple effects that we can't exactly predict. My feeling is that the, while we may see a resurgence of COVID-19 and development of that, it's, we know a lot more than we did a few months ago. It's some other novel things that we haven't figured out that they could jump up and bite us. I think it's a time for really um, trying to be diversified and flexible. We've been saying that for a while. Vigilant and flexible are the two things we can be because that other shoe dropping might not be the size, same size or shape as the last one that came. I think the computer knows when I want to speak and it just turns off my camera. Okay. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I, I would love to cover, you know, a couple of the things we talked about that, that people could be doing or should be doing right now. Um, first of all, I think, you know, every, everyone that, that's tuned in, I, I would give yourself a pat on the back because I think even just, you know, gathering this outside input and um, being thoughtful with what you're doing and, and how you're doing it, you know, all of that, all of that leads to taking, you know, making measured decisions. And so I, I think that's a great first step. Um, but then, you know, taking some time to reflect. So thinking about your risk tolerance, was there anything, you, did you realize anything different with your risk tolerance over the past couple of months? And, and we've seen this actually swing both ways. Um, but kind of paying attention to what that gut reaction during some of the different market events this year, you know, what did that feel like? What did, um, you know, how did, how did you process that? And, and, you know, we always talk about, we don't, we don't want to take drastic steps in the short term. We always want to bear in mind the long-term implications of any decisions that we make. But I think having an awareness of, of your risk tolerance and maybe how that may have evolved or not evolved is, is definitely a good conversation to have. Um, and also just taking inventory of what you have. So do you have enough emergency reserves in place? It doesn't matter how much money a family has. If, if they don't feel, if you don't feel as if you can get your hands on cash when you need it as readily and at the right level, then it's a huge stressor. It's, it's really one of the top stressors. But if those emergency reserves are at a comfortable level, then it kind of allows you know, the rest of the investments, um, it allows you a, a little bit of a break with the rest of the investments to allow them to work towards those midterm or longer term goals. And then as far as inventory, also, where are all the other financial assets that you have? So taking a look at your balance sheet and revisiting that and making sure, you know, when we think about a balance sheet for families, we always like to, to come at it from the perspective of every asset on there should have a purpose. And, and if you don't recall what that purpose is, or you look up and realize, well, it did have a purpose maybe 10 years ago, but that purpose no longer exists, then there may be opportunities to consolidate some of your, your accounts or your positions. Or if, if you know, you, you every once in a while get that fleeting thought of, oh, I forgot that I had that account, but you might have too many accounts. <laughs> and so, um, you know, and feel free to, to to reach out to us and we're, we're happy to go through that with you to, to help figure out, all right, what can be combined, what can't be combined, but just recognize everything on your balance sheet, even if it's a minimal amount of management, requires management, requires oversight. So as much as that can be streamlined, um, that's all the better. And then just in general, um, when thinking about, you know, updating your financial plan. So there may have been some things over the past couple of months that may have 
um, dictated a change to your financial plan. Maybe your income streams are different. They look different from how they looked before, or maybe you have new buckets to pull from for one reason or another, or you're coming upon a Social Security decision, which you might have had a strategy in place, call it six months ago, that maybe isn't the best strategy for you now in light of where you're at in your, in your financial world. So revisiting some of those things, even if, if you kind of had a game plan in place, just make sure that it's still the right game plan. Um, and then on the kind of the opportunistic side, we're actually we're having a lot of um, conversations around like Roth conversions, for for instance, you know Roth conversion really has has bubbled up to the top again. It's it's been something that we've talked about before, but with the Secure Act um, changing the requirements around inherited IRA distributions, whereas before if a non-spouse inherited your IRA they could take distributions over their lifetime, which might have been 30 years or so. That has changed. Now those accounts need to be fully distributed within 10 years, with a few exceptions, but for the most part. And so thinking proactively about how to maybe move some of those dollars into a tax-free bucket during your lifetime may make sense, especially in a year like this year when you don't have a required minimum distribution. So it just opens up the door for some new strategies this year. Um, and I would say the same thing on the charitable side. You might have charitable intent in certain organizations that you really enjoy supporting, and they may have an exceptional need this year. So thinking about how to um, tax efficiently give to those, those organizations, either in this year or building out a longer term plan, you know, all of that stuff I think is, is you know, a great area to, to spend some energy. Um, and, and as Dennis mentioned, just Staying diligent and flexible. You know, so much of it comes back to flexibility because we don't know what's going to happen next. Could be positive, could be negative, but um, making sure that that you're you're measured in the decision making approach and that you're um, you know taking the time to process it and to um, you know we we welcome anybody to reach out for some one on one conversations if you're thinking about something and want to see it illustrated. You know, that's always a uh, a welcome conversation. And just for, for a minute too, uh, along those lines, you know, we do this work, Cody and Dennis and I and everyone on our staff because we love this profession, love this work, and, and it's, it's fun to do and it's exciting to, you know, spend the time with the clients to get to know each of you individually and your families individually. I mean, that's that's why we do what we do. But this year, as challenging as it has been, I think in a lot of respects, it, it, it's actually been especially rewarding because we have had some really great conversations and, and, and the ability to go back and revisit the plans and to be proactive in the portfolio and to help you know, walk you guys through any questions or challenges that you might have. It's just, it's, it's such a privilege to, to be part of those, those um, decisions that your families are making. But we also recognize not everybody has that with their advisors and that there are some people that are, are trying to figure things out and it's, it's challenging sometimes to do that by themselves. So, or, or perhaps they have an advisor that maybe isn't as vested into the relationship or doesn't have the ability to be as vested into the relationship as they would like to be. So if, there, if you do have family or friends that you feel that they can benefit from having the types of conversations that we have, we would love an introduction or an opportunity to see if there's, there's some way that we can help support them and their families in their decision-making process. I, I, think that's a, I think that's a great point about the, um, you know, just some of those financial decisions. If we talk about return on investment, we think about performance. How did my funds perform? How did my accounts perform? But, as financial planners, we like to think about return on decision making too. There's an ROI to that. There's a return on tax efficiency. There's a return on something like a Roth conversion or paying down debt. You know, you know, what is the best use of cash? Maybe it's not maybe it's not buying American Airlines stock. Maybe it's paying down that particular liability that has a four percent interest rate, something like that. There's that's why we think these planning conversations are important. And times like this foster creativity. And it's not always as easy as picking the last good thing. That's why we talked about 
broken asset classes. That's why we're talking about different planning strategies and those things. Um, you know, th these conversations that we are having with you and your families are helping us to be creative and hopefully helping you to get a return on investments and also a return on decision making and making better decisions as we as we go along. Um, no, so I guess yeah, the, the, only last, point. Yeah, the, the only last thing. Um, so we, we've met, we're mentioning, you know, how is the government going to pay for all this? And then another question we get is, is there a bubble in stocks? Um, government paying for all of this for right now. This is an experiment in what they call modern monetary theory. This is the idea that you can expand government balance sheets, you know, to infinity and that as long as there's a market for that debt, it's a sustainable thing. And there, there, this was talked about theoretically for years leading up to this. Practically, it's being it's being tried right now. How long can we maintain, you know, high volumes of debt for a period of time to support a culture? Realistically, I mean, people have to stay home. This is this is dollars being printed to support that. There is a theory that it can work. Um, <laughs> I don't know, and no one does for sure. But I can say that there is um, at least, I think the animal spirits that have come back in certain parts of the economy are very heartening. That's what we're gonna need to see to, to get some sustainability. But you know, from a policy making standpoint, we're in just foreign territory and we just don't know. Um, lastly, is there a bubble in stocks? And we would say that the there is always an over, coming off of a crisis, there's always an overinflation the stock prices and there's always the sense that prices have outstripped the fundamentals um this is a really extreme example i tend not to believe that there's a bubble in stocks there is probably more of a bubble in still um low quality debt companies that issued low quality debt that are finding themselves really challenged to pay that debt back i'm more concerned about that that's where owning the right kinds of companies and, and having some element of active managers picking stocks to avoid that, that can help out in those spaces uh, and staying away from kind of the junky high yield side of bonds. So I, I'm not concerned about stocks being in a bubble that usually doesn't happen. And we cited this, um, I think last week, Cody in the one report, what did they say the average time after stocks hit break even when they bounce back? What's the average time? They uh, spend? I don't remember the exact, the exact average time. I think it was like four years. So it was like a, usually there's four years of bull market af after the time that stocks hit their break even point. Um, that now that isn't always the case, but it does bode well for things hitting their break even point, coming back to neutral, and continuing to go higher at least for some period of time. So, just want to uh, one more time to see if there's any questions or anything we can answer from a. <clears throat> from a market perspective or just changes in policy. We have seen a few developments recently about required minimum distributions. We're starting to see some movement on other things related to uh, retirement planning, but any questions we can answer uh, for the audience today? All right. Well, we want to thank you all for joining us. We really appreciate it. We're trying to do these um, on a pretty regular basis. Hopefully you catch our weekly market updates where we talk about some things that we've seen but for our quarterly commentaries, we want to pull it back to some bigger, bigger themes and topics that are going to be more universal that I uh, think hopefully resonate with the way that we invest for you. So feel free to reach out to us directly if you have any questions. We really appreciate you joining us today. And uh, again, thank you for, for your trust. And uh, you know, rest assured, we, we want to continue to earn your, your confidence. And, um, and we would just uh, appreciate the relationships that you brought that are so fulfilling for us. So everyone have a very good. 4th of July weekend, and we'll catch up with you soon.